Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is reversing motor starter examples. Our objective is to examine the ladder logic diagrams of two different configurations of reversing motor starters performing common industrial functions. This lecture operates under the assumption you've watched the reversing motor starters lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. This lecture examines two different ladder logic diagrams for the purposes of applying a number of concepts we've thus far discussed, specifically reversing motor starters. Keep in mind, I do not expect you at this point in your education to design ladder logic diagrams, but rather interpret existing ladder logic diagrams. Consider this lecture an opportunity to put this skill to practice. Pause the lecture often and see if you can figure out how the system would respond to certain input conditions. Draw pictures, take notes. As you'll recall, a reversing magnetic motor starter uses paired contactors to selectively reverse a motor. The reversing contactor is wired such that two phases are interchanged, thereby applied phase sequence as seen by the motor changes the direction of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator. The contactors are ordinarily interlocked via mechanical, electrical, or push button means to prevent phase-to-phase -phase contact. Consider the ladder logic diagram of a simple motor-driven garage door opening system. The logic is essentially the same as an ordinary reversing magnetic motor starter with a minor exception of the inclusion of two normally closed limit switches, LS top and LS bottom, designed to respectively limit the upper and lower reaches of travel of the garage door. The mechanical system features a motor and a chain drive that selectively lifts or lowers the door pending direction of rotation. The primary schematic features a lift contactor wired such that the motor and chain drive pulls the door open. The lower contactor is wired such that the motor and chain drive slides the door closed. Let's assume there's some mechanical dampening on the chain drive and track that slows the descent of the lifted door. Note the inclusion of a spring set electrically released friction brake in the primary schematic. This friction brake keeps the door suspended if either contactor is de-energized or during a power loss. Let's take a walk through the ladder logic diagram and see how this system works. The pilot schematic for this system features an e-stop in series with a normally closed stop push button. The remainder of rung 1 and spilling over into rung 2 is an electrically interlocked three-wire control circuit used to control the lift contactor with the inclusion of a normally closed top limit switch. Rung 3 and spilling over into rung 4 is an electrically interlocked three-wire control circuit used to control the lower contactor with the inclusion of the normally closed bottom limit switch. Note the mechanically and electrically interlocked lift and lower contactors prevent the simultaneous closure of the contactors and direct phase-to-phase -phase contact. Note the normally closed overload contact in rung 1 serves to protect the motor from sustained overloads in both lift or lower mode. Assuming the system begins the day with the door closed, the normally closed bottom limit switch would be activated into its opposite open state. Note the arrow modifier indicates that this is a normally closed limit switch being held open. This open limit switch prevents an unusually dull operator from attempting to lower an already lowered door. Any closure of the lower button serves no purpose since the triggered bottom limit switch prevents the lower contactor coil from being energized. An operator wishing to open the closed door presses the momentary contact lift push button. Via the normally closed e-stop, the normally closed stop, the now closed lift push button, the normally closed top limit switch, the normally closed lower two electrical interlock, and the normally closed overload contact, the lift coil of the lifting contactor would be energized. When the coil of the lift contactor is energized, its associated contacts change states. The lift one holding contact in parallel with the lift push button closes. The normally closed lift two electrical interlock opens, and the primary lift contacts close. The spring set electrically released friction brake is disengaged. Notice the applied phase sequence as provided by the lift primary contactor is L1, 
L2, L3. The motor and chain drive lifts the door as intended. As the door opens, note the normally closed bottom limit switch being held open returns to its deactivated closed state once the tag stops triggering it. An operator can now release the momentary contact lift push button and the spring return will return it to its normally open deactivated state. Note that the now closed lift 1 holding contact maintains the energized state of the lift contactor coil. This means the primary lift contactor stays closed and the motor continues opening the door. That's the point of the holding circuit. It maintains the last asserted state. Whatever vicious beast you've got behind the door rushes into the arena and begins tearing apart members of a marginalized and persecuted minority group much to the cheers of the assembled blood-crazed fans. If an operator wished to stop the door mid-travel, they could press and release the normally closed stop push button. Opening the stop push button would de-energize the lift contactor coil and disengage the holding circuit. Note the friction brake would park the suspended door in whatever position it was currently at. If however an operator wanted to sit back and let the door continue lifting, the top limit switch at the limits of travel opens when the tag strikes it and similarly de-energizes the lift contactor. The lift 1 holding contact would open, the lift 2 electrical interlock would close, and the primary lift contact would open. The de-energized spring set friction brake parks the suspended door in the fully open position as intended. Note the normally closed top limit switch being held open prevents an unusually dull operator from attempting to lift an already lifted door. Any closure of the lift push button after the door has already been lifted to the limits of travel serves no purpose since the triggered top limit switch prevents the lift contactor coil from being energized. An operator wishing to lower the fully opened door presses the momentary contact lower push button. Via the e-stop, the stop, the now closed lower push button, the lift 2 electrical interlock, the bottom limit switch, and the normally closed overload contact, the lowering contactor coil would be energized. When the coil of the lowering contactor is energized, its associated contacts change state. The lower 2 electrical interlock opens, the lower one holding contact closes, and the primary lower contacts close. The spring sat electrically released friction brake is disengaged. Notice applied phase sequence as provided by the lower contactor is L2, L1, L3. The motor and chain drive lowers the door as intended. Let's assume there's some mechanical dampening on the chain drive and track that slows the descent of the lifted door. The operator can now release the momentary contact lower push button and the spring return would return it to its normally open deactivated state. Note that the now closed lower one holding contact maintains the energized state of the lower contactor coil. This means the primary lower contactor stays closed and the motor continues closing the door. That's the point of the holding circuit. It maintains the last asserted state. Note the normally closed top limit switch being held open returns to its deactivated closed state once the tag stops triggering it. If an operator wished to stop the door mid-travel, they could press and release the normally closed stop push button. Opening the stop button would de-energize the lower contactor coil and disengage the holding circuit. Note the friction brake would park the suspended door in whatever position it was currently at. If however an operator wanted to sit back and let the door continue lowering, as soon as the door strikes the bottom limit switch at the limits of travel, it de-energizes the lower contactor coil and the associated contacts return to their deactivated state. The lower two electrical interlock closes, the lower one holding contact opens, and the primary lower contacts open. The de-energized spring set friction brake parks the door in the fully closed position as intended. Note is currently implemented only the operator initiated e-stop and stop serves to prevent a foreign object or person from being crushed by a closing door. It is for this reason additional automatic safety mechanisms can be added to this system. Consider the inclusion of a photoelectric through-beam scanner scanning the passageway. The pilot ladder logic is modified to include a normally closed photoelectric switch in rung 3. 
PE1. Note that in its deactivated state, when no object disrupts the beam path from transmitter to receiver, the photoelectric switch in no way, shape, or form affects the functionality of the system in lift or lower mode. If, however, an object is present and disrupts the beam, the photoelectric switch is activated into its open position. Consider a scenario in which the door is lifted to the topmost position. However, prior to lowering the door, an obstructing object disrupted the beam. The photoelectric switch would be triggered into its activated open position and prevent the lower contactor coil from being energized until the offending object is removed from the path. Consider yet another scenario in which the system is in the act of lowering the door and no object is initially present. If, however, some dim-witted operator bebopped into the path of the actively closing door, the photoelectric switch would be activated into its open position and de-energize the lowering contact or coil, opening the lower primary contacts and disengaging the holding circuit. Note the spring set electrically released friction brake would park the suspended door in whatever position it was currently at. The system could be lifted, however would no longer lower the door until the offending object is removed from the path of the photoelectric through beam scanner. The inclusion of the photoelectric switch therefore serves to marginally increase the safety of our system. Note, as currently implemented, if an object breaks the beam but is struck by the descending door, the system would stop lowering the door but would hold it in place. Not exactly the best of scenarios if the object breaking the beam path happens to be your foot or your head. It is for this reason we'll consider a slightly more robust safety system that not only stops lowering the door, but also lifts it to the limits of travel when the through beam is interrupted while the door is descending. Note this ladder logic diagram includes not only a normally closed photoelectric switch that de-energizes the lowering contact or coil when triggered, but also a normally open photoelectric switch that simultaneously energizes the lifting contact or coil when triggered. I've included a mechanical interlock symbol between the two switches to indicate that when the normally open contact closes, the normally closed contact simultaneously opens. Note as implemented, this particular configuration necessitates two two-terminal electrically isolated photoelectric switches, not a single three-terminal single-pole double-throw transfer switch with a common and both a normally open and normally closed side, as is common for some solid-state photoelectric switches, because there would be a voltage differential between the left terminals of the two switches pending the asserted state. We'll discuss photoelectric switches in greater detail in later lectures, and most likely do greater justice to our simple garage door opener circuit when we examine programmable logic controllers. Regardless, let's see how this particular circuit behaves when in the act of lowering the door, some clueless dummy bebops underneath it. In lower mode, the lowering primary contactor is closed as is the lower on holding contact. The lower two electrical interlock is open, thereby ensuring both contactors are never simultaneously energized. When the photoelectric switch is triggered into its activated opposite state by an obstruction, the normally open switch closes and the normally closed switch opens. Due to the open lower two electrical interlock in rung one, it would appear that the lift contactor coil is not immediately energized However, the open photoelectric switch in rung 4 de-energizes the lower contact or coil and the associated contacts return to their opposite states. The lower primary contacts open, as does the lower 1 holding contact. As soon as the lower 2 electrical interlock in rung 1 closes, given the photoelectric switch is still being triggered by the obstruction, the closure of the lower 2 electrical interlock energizes the lift contact or coil and the system immediately switches to lift mode, bypassing the stop intermediary. This is a plugging action characterized by the immediate reversal of directional rotation. When the lift contact or coil is energized, its associated contacts change states. The lift one holding contact closes, the lift two electrical interlock opens, and the primary lift contacts close. The spring sat electrically released friction brake 
remains disengaged, and the motor immediately reverses direction and begins lifting the door. Note that the now closed lift one holding contact would maintain the energized state of the lift contactor coil even if the obstruction is removed from the path of the photoelectric through beam scanner in the process of lifting the door. As previously, the door would continue lifting until it reached the limits of travel. The top limit switch opens when the tag strikes and it would de-energize the lift contactor coil. The de-energized spring set friction brake would park the suspended door in the fully open position as intended. The individual that narrowly avoided being crushed to a pulpy goo could now continue on their merry way. Let us now examine an entirely different circuit making use of a reversing motor starter. This ladder logic diagram governs the operation of a reciprocating conveyor belt that once started and initialized with the chosen direction continually oscillates back and forth between two limit switches. This could be utilized to perform some industrial process like a repetitive assembly line or agitation of a product on a belt. The primary schematic again consists of paired contactors wired such that the forward contactor produces clockwise rotation and the reversing contactor produces counterclockwise rotation by swapping two phases. The ladder logic diagram is best examined as three functional blocks. Rungs one and two make use of a control relay that governs the starting and stopping of the whole system. Note of contact CR2 associated with the CR control relay coil is not closed. None of the remaining rungs will assert an output. Rungs three, four, and five govern the forward contactor. Rungs six, seven, and eight govern the reverse contactor. Note the mechanically and electrically interlocked forward and reverse contactor coils. These interlocks ensure the forward and reverse contactor are never simultaneously closed. Additionally, note the use of two mechanically interlocked limit switches, LS1 and LS2. I've colored the limit switches and annotated the mechanical interlock to purposely avoid the use of an ugly rung spanning dashed line. Note when the normally open side of a particular limit switch closes, the normally closed side simultaneously opens. Let's walk through the ladder logic diagram and see how this system works. Assuming the system begins the day with the object to be shuttled back and forth in the center of the conveyor belt means none of the limit switches are being triggered into their activated opposite state. An operator wishing to initiate the system presses the start push button. Via the e-stop, the stop, and the now closed start push button, the coil of the control relay is energized. When the coil of the control relay is energized, its associated contacts change to their activated opposite state. The CR1 holding contact closes, as does the CR2 contact. An operator could release the start push button and the CR1 holding contact maintains this last asserted state. Nothing happens. An operator must now choose an initial direction. An operator can start the conveyor belt in the forward direction by pressing the forward push button. The forward contactor coil is energized. When the forward contactor coil is energized, its associated contacts are activated into their opposite state. The F1 holding contact closes, the F2 electrical interlock opens, and the primary F contacts close. The conveyor belt initiates movement in the forward direction. An operator can release the forward push button and the now closed F1 holding contact will maintain the last asserted state. When the conveyor belt has moved long enough in the forward direction, the object to be shuttled back and forth strikes limit switch 2 at the right limits of travel. When limit switch 2 is activated, the normally closed side in rung 3 opens, and the normally open side in rung 8 closes. The now open limit switch in rung 3 de-energizes the F contactor coil, and its associated contacts return to their deactivated state. The F1 holding contact opens, removing the holding circuit. The F2 electrical interlock closes, and the F primary contacts open. Note as soon as the F2 electrical interlock closes, via the still closed limit switch 2 in rung 8, the reversing contactor coil is energized. When the reversing contactor coil is energized, its associated contacts change to their opposite states. The R2 electrical interlock opens, 
the R1 holding contact closes, and the reversing primary contacts close. The conveyor belt begins moving in the opposite direction. Note as soon as the object to be shuttled back and forth departs the reset region of limit switch 2, the mechanically interlocked limit switch 2 contacts will return to their deactivated states. The normally closed side in rung 3 closes, and the normally open side in rung 8 opens. Note because of the holding contact R1 in rung 7, the reverse mode is still asserted and the conveyor belt continues moving in the reverse direction until such time that the object to be shuttled back and forth strikes limit switch 1. The act of striking limit switch 1 closes the open side and opens the closed side. The now open limit switch in rung 6 de-energizes the reversing contact or coil and the associated contacts return to their deactivated state. The R2 electrical interlock closes, the R1 holding contact opens, and the reversing primary contacts open. As soon as the R2 electrical interlock in rung 3 closes, the forward contact or coil is energized via the now closed limit switch in rung 5. And you guessed it, the forward mode is asserted. The F1 holding contact closes, the F2 electrical interlock opens, and the F primary contacts close. The conveyor belt changes direction yet again, and the object to be shuttled back and forth begins rightward progress. Note as the object to be shuttled back and forth departs the reset region of limit switch 1, the limit switch contacts return to their deactivated state. The normally open side in rung 5 opens, and the normally closed side in rung 6 closes. Due to the F1 holding contact, the forward mode is asserted until limit switch 2 is struck, and then the process repeats itself in the reverse direction until limit switch 1 is struck and the process repeats itself in the forward direction until limit switch 2 is struck, and on and on and on. An operator choosing to stop this reciprocating conveyor belt at any point in its cycle simply needs to either open the stop or the e-stop, which de-energizes the control relay coil, and its associated contacts return to their deactivated state. The CR1 holding contact opens, as does the CR2 contact. The now open CR2 contact de-energizes whichever contact or coil is currently being asserted, and de-energizes the motor. When an operator releases the stop push button, the system is ready to initiate yet another day of reciprocation. In summary, this circuit making use of a reversing motor starter selectively energizes and de-energizes the forward and reversing contactor based on the position of the object on the conveyor belt. Once initialized, it will continue to do so without the necessity of bathroom breaks, lunch breaks, or smoke breaks. All right, this about wraps up our examination of these example circuits making use of reversing motor starters. Again, keep in mind at this point in your education, I am not asking you to design ladder logic diagrams. All I'm asking you to do is to be able to interpret existing ladder logic diagrams and determine the response given various input conditions. My intention in this lecture was to serve as a guide for a representative sample of ladder logic diagrams, utilizing some of the concepts and devices we've thus far discussed, notably reversing motor starters. In conclusion, this lecture examined a couple circuits making use of a reversing motor starter. Though their function and purpose differed, note each primary circuit made use of paired contactors wired such that the forward and reverse contactor produced opposite rotation by swapping two phases. The latter logic made use of mechanical and electrical interlocks to ensure the forward and reversing contactor are never simultaneously energized. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.